Praise the Lord. Church, I said, praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to uh, Sunday worship today in Jesus' name. And for those who are coming for the first time, we love you. We appreciate your being here. And we believe as the Lord has been blessing us, he will bless you too. And for all our old timers, everyone here today, children, youths, students, as well as adults, fathers and mothers, great 2020 blessing upon you in Jesus' name. There is going to be a glorious day. Happy day. I was glad, I was happy, I was joyful when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Sunday should be the happiest day of your week. All the day giving to God, not giving to extra moral studies, studying somewhere on Sunday, the day belongs to the Lord. And thank God you are here. And you delight in the Lord. And the Lord is going to bless everyone beyond your expectation in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we thank you for this hour. Thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you, Lord, for the Lord's day, not man's day, not business day, not commercial day, not holiday. The Lord's day that you have brought us together today to worship and to serve you. We're asking, Lord, you accept our worship today in Jesus' name. And we're asking that the blessings of worship will come upon everyone, children and youth and students and adults, fathers and mothers, everyone in Jesus' name. And we pray that the time we spend in your presence will be a time of blessing a time of joy that will saturate us with your blessing and send us forth into the week to be strong and to do exploits for the Lord in Jesus name shower your blessings upon everyone we thank you because we know you have answered in Jesus name we pray and the happy church said Amen God bless you. We're coming to 1 John chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 1. 1 John chapter 5, we're reading from verse 1. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, is born anew, is born from above, is born again. And everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. Everyone that is begotten of God, everyone that is born again, loves other children of God who are also born again. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. His, his commandments are not exome. His commandments are not the things that weary us and as if, you know, why are we having the commandments of God? We take the commandments of God with delight and with joy for whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. You will overcome the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. For who is he that overcomes the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Look at verse 10. He that believeth on the Son of God has the witness in himself. He that believeth not God has made him a liar 
because he believeth not the record that God gave of his son. And this is the record that God has given to us, eternal life, and this life eternal is in his son. He that has the son has life, eternal life. He that has not the Son of God has not life, has not everlasting life, has not eternal life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence, this is the assurance that we have in him that if we ask anything, if we ask anything, if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Verse 18, we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself. And somebody help me read that last part. And are you not the person I'm talking about? The last part of verse 18. This week, he will not touch you. This year, he will not touch you. For the rest of your life, he will not touch you. God will so position you, and God will so surround you with angelic hosts from heaven, that wicked one will not touch you. Remove questions from your mind. Remove doubts from your mind. Understand you. Whatever happens to another person, you in particular, that wicked one will not touch you. And the wicked one touches him not. We're looking at the word of God today on the unlimited possibilities of faith in Christ. The unlimited possibilities of faith in Christ. As we look at the verses we're going to read and learn from in this chapter, there are three things we're looking at. Number one, the power of faith over the world. The power of faith over the world. Number two, the prayer of faith for his wonders. The prayer of faith for his wonders. Anytime we pray, Whatever it is we're praying for, we're praying that the wonders of God will come upon our lives. Wonder of all wonders, you will not miss it today. The prayer of faith for his wonders. Point number three, our preservation through faith from the wicked. Our preservation through faith from the wicked. I rejoice with you that you are in the service today. Something will happen to you. Inside you. All the unbelief will vanish away. All the doubts will vanish away. If you have been thinking that, you know, bad things are near, death is near, disease is near, whatever it is, the word of God and the fire of the Spirit will drive those things away from you in Jesus' name. New life is coming to you. New power is coming to you. After the message, you will pray. I said you will pray. Wonders will descend from heaven. Point number three, the preservation through faith from the wicked. Let's come back to number one. What's your number one on the paper there? Say it now. Say it as if you know this power is coming upon your life. The power of faith over the world. Let's come back to First John chapter 5. 
I'm reading from verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. That word whatsoever is the word that is used for whosoever in that verse. It means whosoever, young, old, man, woman, whosoever, a new convert, a minister, a real child of God, a worker in the vineyard, a pastor, a preacher, whosoever, in fact, is talking about every believer and is talking about you, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Your faith will overcome the world. Your world around you, your faith will prevail. Your world in the village, your faith will prevail. Your world in your place of work, the, the faith will prevail. As you go to the market, as you go up and down on the road, in the church, at home, in the village, everywhere, your faith will prevail over the world in Jesus' name. Hey, look at that again, second part of that uh, verse. In verse 4 it says, And this uh, the victory that overcomes the world, even everybody tell me, make it personal, my faith. Your faith will overcome the world. But what does it mean when it says our faith will overcome the world? Number one, is talking about the world of evil. The world of evil. I'm looking at Galatians chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 4. Galatians chapter 1 verse 4, Who gave himself our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. That's why he died. If all the evil that came on us, before we were born again, if all those evils are still piled on us and are still tormenting us and are still driving us elter skelter, where is the redemption? Where is the salvation? He gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world. And then according to the will of God and our Father. Number one, we overcome the evil world. Every evil in the world and around you, you'll overcome. Number two is talking about the world of sin. This world is a world of sin. And it says, we have the faith. If we're born again, we have the faith, if we're begotten of God, that we overcome the world of sin. Look at John chapter 16. When he talks about the world, it's not talking about something that is, uh, you know, just floating there. It's something definite that you war against that sin and you overcome. Look at John chapter 16, and I'm reading from verse, uh, from verse 8. It says in verse 8, and when he is come, it will reprove the world of sin. The world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. This world is described by the Lord himself as the world of sin. And when you live in that world, you know, sin here and sin there and sin everywhere. And everywhere you go, you can see sin. But to be like a white lily that is growing out of the mud, you remain white. And the Lord will make you whiter than snow in Jesus' name. I overcome. I said I overcome. The world of evil, you overcome. The world of sin, you overcome. Number three, the world of unrighteousness. The world of unrighteousness. Romans chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 19. Romans chapter 3, reading from verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world, think about that, all the world, all the world may become guilty before God. Why are they guilty? Why is it that all the world will be guilty? Look at it from verse 10. As it is written, 
there is none righteous, no, not one, a world of unrighteousness. There is none that understandeth. There is none that uh, seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They all together become a profitable, a profitable world. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The, the poison of asp is under their leaves, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are sweet to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. Their, the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. We, now we know. From all those things we have read, now we know. From all the verses before us, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law that every mouth in the world may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That world of unrighteousness, your faith will overcome. They will not suck you into their righteousness in Jesus' name. Number four is the world of godlessness. The world of godlessness. When it says, this is the faith that overcomes the world, it's talking about the world of evil. It's talking about the world of sin. It's talking about the world of unrighteousness. It's talking about the world of godlessness. That's why it says in um, James chapter 4, James chapter 4, they don't believe in God. There's no fear of God in their eyes and in their action. There's no fear of God. And when it says you overcome, thank God you are an overcomer. I say, thank God you are an overcomer. You're not a lot going nearer and nearer unto Sodom. And you are not a demon that is going and pitching his tent in the world. But you overcome the world. I said you overcome the world. They'll try and beckon on you. They'll try to invite you. But there is the spirit of God in your heart saying, that's the world. That's the world. I know you. I recognize you. I see the godlessness in you. I overcome you in Jesus' name. I said it for myself. You overcome godlessness in the world in Jesus' name. Look at James chapter 4 verse 4. Ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Why? They plan without God. They act without God. They do their merriment without God. They have their nightclubs without God. They have their cinema shows without thinking about God. They impact and influence society without bringing God in. The world is godless. And so, anyone that joins with the world, a friend of the world, loving their amusements, loving their merriment, loving their drinking and dancing, loving their nightclubs, not, not loving all the fleshly manifestations and demonstrations, is an enemy of God because the world is godless. And then it says, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. You will not worship in vain. If you come to church, you say, I worship God, and then in the afternoon, you go back to the world, you are friends of the world, your worship is in vain because you are following and you are sucked in and you are influenced and you are defiled by the godless world. Number three is the world of disobedience and wrath. The world of disobedience and wrath is like, uh, you know, the world is teaching everyone that will listen to them disobedience. Look at it on the street. Look at it in the motor vehicle. 
Look at it against the government. Look at it in the family. Look at it in the, in the regular secular society. Look at it in the nominal church. It's a world of disobedience. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. And you are see quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past he walked according to the cause of this world. The cause of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. That's the mark of the world. That's the trademark of the world. Disobedience everywhere. And it says, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. The world is a world of disobedience, a world of rebellion, a world of lawlessness. But it's the faith in us, the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ that makes us to overcome, that makes us to conquer the world of disobedience. It's a world of corruption. You know that. You hear the news and you hear everything they are saying about this one is corrupt, that one is corrupt. They even set up a committee, a council, and they set up a, a panel of people that will run after everybody in every street, in every town, and they say they have caught this one, they have captured that one. What have you captured them for? We saw corruption in them. Every day there's no time, you don't hear about it. Because the world in which we live is the world of corruption. That corruption will not affect you. That corruption will not get to you. You will not put your hand in corruption. I was waiting for your amen. You will not put your life into corruption in Jesus' name. What's the use? You swallow something and it's corruption. And then they catch you and it takes you another 10 years, 20 years and in the prison to vomit out that corruption you have swallowed. No, your faith will overcome. I said your faith will overcome. In 2 Peter chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 19. In 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 19, while they promised them liberty they themselves are the servants of corruption for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought into bondage for he after they have escaped the pollutions of the world the corruption of the world through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning your latter end will not be worse your latter end will be better your future will be brighter on the condition on the basis that the face of christ is in you and that faith makes you to overcome the world of corruption. Number seven is the world of tradition. The world of tradition. You see, the world in which we live, they have developed tradition. And it comes from the village. It comes from the bush. It comes from idolatry. It comes from all the practices of wicked and evil people. And as the children are born, those idolatrous parents and those unbelieving parents, they're teaching them tradition, tradition, tradition. Even when they have gone to school, even when we have gone to school and we have gone to college and university, whatever science we learn, the superstition, and the tradition still remains intact because it's a world of tradition. God will deliver you. God has delivered you already. 
and you will not go back to those uh, traditions in the world in Jesus' name. Colossians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 8. Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Look at this. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, of the world, of the world, and not after Christ. You see, there are people who are ruined, there are people who are already destroyed because of the tradition of the world. But when you come to Christ, and Christ lives righteous in you, lives big in you, all the traditions are brought down and they are destroyed in Jesus' name. You know, there are people who think, I can go to any church. I come here now, but maybe the other, next Sunday I'll go to that other place because church is church. Uh-uh. Worship is worship. Uh-uh. It's not so. Look at Mark chapter 7. Verse 13, Mark chapter 7, verse 13. It says, making the word of none effect through your tradition. There are preachers who are sold to tradition. There are churches who are sold to tradition. And there are denominations that are totally given to tradition. They come to church on Sunday and then they preach something they call the word of God, but their tradition overrides, overpowers, and erases the effect and the transformation of the word. Because whatever message they hear, they're going to go back to tradition. And they make void of the word of God. They make it of none effect through their tradition. The world of tradition we overcome. You will overcome. You will not be involved in that again in Jesus' name. Number eight, there is the world of darkness. There is the world of darkness. There are people that have powers of darkness. They belong to societies you don't even want to think about. And they hurt people, and they destroy people, and they destroy pregnancy, and they destroy progress, and they destroy the prospects of people. And they do a lot of things because of the darkness of the world. But thank God, I thank God for you there. I thank God for your sister there. I said I thank God for your brother there. The darkness of the world and the world of darkness, I overcome. You will overcome. Darkness will not have the final say in your life. And you know, there are people that come to a church like this. If you want to give your life to Jesus, raise up your hand, they raise up their hands. You can put down your name. The counselors will cancel you. They put down their names. And then they go through some classes, you know, lessons and this and that. You'll be baptized in water. I'm ready. They baptize them in water. But you know what? In their confession, in their repentance, they never brought that darkness to the open to say, this is who I am. This is where I've been, and this is what I've been doing. And they still remain under the influence of the world of darkness. But you will not be like that. If somebody dies and he remains in the world of darkness until his death, no matter who conducts the burial ceremony, that person will go to tell me, or go to hell. If you are there, I'm a member of Deeper Life. I rejoice with you. But I'm asking you, do you have the faith that you have overcome the world of darkness? Or are the other people in the world of darkness telling you, if you live 
us. This is what we're going to do to you. Fear will not send you to hell. I said fear will not send you to hell. Leave, repent, call upon the Lord and the power of faith in Christ will make you overcome the world of darkness in Jesus' name. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 12. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Darkness of this world. The powers are the principalities, the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. By faith we overcome the world of sinful pleasure. The world of sinful pleasure. I'm looking at Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts and worldly lusts and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There's the world of sinful pleasure. And uh, you know there are people, men and women, that live in sinful pleasure, and then they say, but you know, we're going to the kingdom of God when our Jesus, our Savior, our Christ shall come. I will be with him in the kingdom. And they're still in the world of sinful pleasure. The pleasure of the flesh. The pleasure of drinking. The pleasure of worldly merriment. And the pleasure of sinful action. Look at First Timothy chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 6. First Timothy, chapter 5, verse 6. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Dead to God. Cannot hear the voice of God. Dead to Christ. Cannot hear the cry of Christ from Calvary. Because he's still in the world of sinful pleasure. The Lord deliver everyone here. Number 10, the world of tempters and temptresses. The world of tempters and temptresses. Some people do not understand that there are temptations because the world is full of tempters. The world is full of temptresses. Women that will leave their own family. And they'll come out as if they're isolated people. And they come and they come to tempt you. Your faith will overcome them. Men will come to tempt you. Your faith will overcome them. They are indwelt by Satan as the believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You will not be indwelt by Satan. Let me hear a good amen. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into a, in the holy city. Look at Satan. Look at the devil. And he's taking Jesus Christ to the holy city. And, and then he setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and says unto him, If thou be the son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, uh, that it is written, he shall give his angels charge uh, concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee, and they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. You know, sometimes when somebody quotes the Bible, you think this one is a church man, this one is a church woman. Uh uh, not every time Satan quoted the Bible, but he wanted to tempt Jesus to do evil. And Jesus said unto him, It is written, Thou shalt shall not tempt the Lord thy God. Again, verse 8 
The devil takes him up into an exceedingly high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. All the kingdoms of the world. When you are daydreaming, and when you are thinking of the glory in that area, the glory in that area, all the kingdoms of the world, and then people are telling you, it's because you are too strict, you are too scriptural, and you swallow the whole Bible, and you cover yourself, you blindfold yourself with the Bible. That's why you don't have this. If you can just push the Bible aside, if you can just forget the Bible, if you can forget about going to hell, not going to hell, if you can forget about Christ is coming and is coming soon, if you can push the Bible aside, you will have these, all the glories of the world. The devil will not have power over you. He says he showed him the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he says unto him, All these will I give thee. If thou will, will, shall fall down and worship me, then Jesus uh, said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou worship. Those tempters and temptresses will leave you alone. You are an overcomer. I am an overcomer. Then the devil leaves him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And then there's a world of compromise. The world of compromise. There are people that are sifting the doctrines of the Bible. I believe this, I don't believe that. I accept this, I don't accept this one. Because if I take this to my place of work, there'll be no promotion. Ah, they're looking at men going to promote them. They're not looking at God who will promote them. My promotion will come from the Lord. They say, if I don't tone down on this, if I don't cut this off, if I don't adjust this, if I don't modify this, I will not make progress. They're looking to the world to give them progress. My progress will come from the Lord. Talk now. Your progress will come from the Lord in Jesus' name. But you know, there are even preachers that compromise. You know why they compromise? If I say this, people will not be converted. Huh? Are you the one to convert them? Are you the one to change them and save them? If I preach the word of God, they will not be converted. So I'm going to preach what they want and what they like and what will make them like me and love me. Look at First John chapter 4. First John chapter 4. And I'm reading to you from verse 5. First John chapter 4 verse 5. They are of the world. Therefore speak day of the world and the world hears them compromise the world of compromise the lord will deliver us the world the lord will set us free and then there's the world of deception the world of deception in second john as only one chapter second john i'm reading from verse seven it says because in second in second john verse seven it says in verse seven for many deceivers are entered into the world into the world and they have made the world a world of deception who confess not that jesus christ is come in the flesh this is a deceiver and an antichrist you will not follow the antichrist our faith overcomes your faith will overcome Look at that, First John chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 4. First John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. Anybody born of God here today? I said anybody born again there today? 
born by the water of the world, born by the Spirit of God, born by the recreative power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Whosoever is born of God overcomes the world of evil, overcomes the world of sin, overcomes the world of unrighteousness, overcomes the world of godlessness, overcomes the world of disobedience and wrath, overcomes the world of corruption, overcomes the world of tradition, overcomes the world of darkness, overcomes the world of sinful pleasure, overcomes the world of tempters and temptresses, overcomes the world of compromise, overcomes the world of deception, you'll be an overcomer. I said you'll be an overcomer. The Spirit of God will not leave you alone. And every time they come and they want to bombard you with those things of the world, you overcome. I overcome. We overcome. And our church will keep on overcoming in Jesus' name. Point number two now is the prayer, the prayer of faith for his wonders. We're coming to First John, chapter 5, verses 14 and 15. First John, chapter 5, 14. It tells us in verse 14, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Whose prayer will be answered today? I said whose prayer will be answered today? Why is it that a believer, a real child of God, having the Bible, you have the Bible there? I said you have the Bible there? Where is your Bible? I said where is your Bible? I said where is your Bible? One single verse in that Bible will knock out the devil out of your life. One single verse from that Bible will heal your sickness and wash away every dirty sin, every evil cell in your life in Jesus' name. One single verse in that Bible. Let me see the Bible. Let me see the Bible. One verse, one verse, one promise of God in that Bible will take you to the mountain top. Let us understand whenever we pray, He hears us. Look at that. He didn't say He heard us in the past, He heard them in the past, He hears us. He has answered your prayer. I see the smile on your face. I see the joy in your life. And I see the provision of God in your life in Jesus' name. Uh, look at verse 15. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever, whatsoever, whatsoever we ask, we know, I know. We know, I know. We know, you know, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Today, you have. Today, I have. Today, I have. Today, I possess. We're talking about the wonders that we ask him in prayer. And he gives us, number one, the wonder of his salvation. Number two, the wonder of his selection. Number three, the wonder of his substitution. Number four, the wonder of his sacrifice. Number five, the wonder of his sanctification. Number six, the wonder of spirit baptism. Number seven, the wonder of supernatural healing. Number eight, the wonder of spectacular deliverance. Number nine, the wonder of special, special miracles. Number ten, the wonder of sustaining supplication. Number eleven, the wonder of his sufficiency. Number twelve, the wonder of his supremacy. The wonder 
in your life as you come to the Lord and you're saying, Oh Lord, here am I. Give me your wonder. Show me your wonder. You'll see wonders today. In your family, you'll see wonders today. In your personal life, you'll see wonders today. But it's by the prayer of faith. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 38. Be it known unto you. Therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe, all without exception, all that believe are justified from all things from which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware therefore, lest that come upon you, which was spoken in the prophets, behold ye despise us and wonder and perish unbelievers for I walk a walk in your days a walk which ye shall in no wise believe though a man declare it unto you the wonder of salvation and it says don't join the unbelievers and think well nothing happens today something is going to happen to you when you ask him of the wonder of his salvation, salvation is a wonder. And even that he chose you, say, he chose me. Say it, say it, he chose me. The selection of the Lord will wonder at that. What have I done? What did I give him? How is it he bypassed thousands and millions of people and he laid hands on you and he selected you and brought you into the kingdom? That's why when you go to pray, you are saying, Oh Lord, I know I am not an accident. I know that your wonder saw me in my sin, in my evil, all the same. You chose me. The Lord has chosen you. Wonder of all wonders, you will not stop wondering in Jesus' name. You know, Paul the Apostle, he said, I wonder, I was an injurious person. I wonder, I was a blasphemous person. I wonder, I was a persecutor. And yet, he chose me. I rejoice with you, you are chosen. I rejoice with you, you are selected. First Corinthians, First Corinthians chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 26. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26. But you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men utter the flesh, and not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised as God chosen. And he has chosen you and the things uh, which are not to bring to naught the things that are. The wonder of his selection, the wonder of his sacrifice. And when you pray, this is what you are praying for. You're saying, oh, I know you will answer me. After all, I was in the wilderness, and then you sought for me, and you went everywhere until you called me, and you brought me into the kingdom. If you have done that for me, and you have selected and chosen me, you will answer my prayer. You will answer your prayer. Look at chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Put out therefore the old leaven, that she may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For Christ, even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Even Christ, our Passover, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
Christ has died for you. And the blood of Jesus Christ avails for you today. And once the heavenly Father can see that blood upon you, the blood of Jesus by faith, calamity will pass over you. Damnation will pass over you. Hellfire judgment will pass over you. Association with Lucifer in hell will pass over you. Because he sacrificed for you the wonder of his substitution. We're coming to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, we're reading from verse 9. The death you shall die, he died for you. That's what we shall say when you come to prayer, Lord. I know I'm not going to perish because you bore my punishment, you bore my shame, and you bore all the eternal death I should have gone through because of that substitution. You have taken the judgment that belonged to me, you have taken it for yourself. I will never see that judgment again. I said, I will never see that judgment again. Hey, look at Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9. But we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor. That by the grace of God he should taste death for every man. He went through that death for everyone. For me. For me, because he died for me, he became my substitute. I will not die that death anymore. You will not die that eternal death anymore in Jesus' name. When you close your eyes here on earth, immediately, because there's no sin to charge to your account anymore. Christ has borne everything. You open your eyes on the other side, you are in heaven already. I said you'll be in heaven already. Now the wonder of his sanctification, the wonder of his sanctification. I'm looking at Joshua chapter 3 verse 5. Joshua chapter 3 verse 5. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, sanctify yourselves, no uncleanness, no filthiness, no darkness, no evil, no secret sin, no besetting sin, no dirt, no defilement. Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. 2020 is a year of wonders. 2020 is a year of supernatural wonders in your life. Sanctify yourselves, consecrate yourself, dedicate yourself, surrender yourself, submit yourself unto God. And this very must Wonders you have never seen will come in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. The wonder of spirit baptism. The wonder of spirit immersion. The wonder of spirit power in your life. In Matthew chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 11. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you. Somebody there, he shall baptize you. He shall baptize you. You know, you're saved, but... Even though you are saved, all the sins you have been committing before, 
they are cleansed, they are washed, everything is taken away. And then he sanctifies you. He removes the Adamic nature from inside your heart. You're pure within and without. But somehow, somehow, power is lacking in your life. You're clean but powerless. You're holy and righteous, but you're trembling. And you're sanctified, saved and sanctified, but it's like, you know, they pour the water on the hand. And therefore, there's, you know, the power is not there. But now, power. I said power. Not the power of sinners. Not the power of criminals. Not the power of evil people. A power greater than all that power. The power of the Holy Ghost. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And everywhere you go, even the evil people, they be clearing out of the way. Why? I'm surprised that as this Holy Ghost baptized brother, Holy Ghost baptized sister is going around the people that used to stand in the way and they say, where are you coming from? Uh, you think that, you know, that deep and light will do anything? We are here. I'm surprised they are not there anymore. Before you, I said they are not there anymore. They don't see you anymore. They see fire coming. They see the flame of fire upon you. He will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And that fire will drive them away in Jesus' name. Uh, let me show you. Look at Zechariah, Old Testament. Now Zechariah, I'm reading from chapter 8. Zechariah, I'm reading from chapter 8. In chapter 8, verse 5. Chapter 8, verse 5. Look at it. Zechariah, chapter 2 rather. Chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 5. For I, says the Lord, will be unto her, a wall of fire round about. I miss your amen there. A wall of fire round about and will be the glory in the midst of her. Look at verse 8. Thus says the Lord of hosts, after the glory as he sent me to the nations which spoiled you. For he that touches you, he that touches you, he that touches you, touches the apple of his eye. The apple of his eye. And then there's a wonder of supernatural healing. The wonder of supernatural healing. You will not be a carrier of sickness. You will not be pregnant of sickness. You will not be closed with sickness. You know some people, can you help us carry that thing? Pastor, I'm carrying enough load already. What do you mean? The sickness, I'm carrying it about. The sickness, it's inside. That pregnancy of sickness will vanish today. The mountain of sickness upon your life, everything will go away today in Jesus' name. You will not carry Satan's load. You will not carry Satan's oppression. You will not carry Satan's affliction. Let the owner of the load carry his own load. I will not carry it for him in Jesus' name. Acts chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 6. Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. I came to church this morning. I have something to give you. I said, I have something to give you. 
the Lord has something to give you, you will receive it before you go in Jesus' name. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Tell me, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength and he leaping, I'm talking about you, he stood up and he walked and he entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. Look at verse 16 and his name, through faith in his name has made this man strong has made this woman strong, has made this boy, this girl strong, whom you see 